Today we have in the YES program the privilege of having a much sought after speaker, Dr. Alok Pandey. Uh, Alokji to me and Alokda to uh, the youngsters all over the world. Apart from that intangible relationship we have, there are at least two more tangible relationships. One is that of course he's a Guru Bhai and the other that he also belongs to the medical fraternity. Uh, with that, uh, now I pass on to Aditi who will give him a little more formal introduction, although he doesn't really need one. Yes, welcome everybody in today's session. Welcome Dr. Alok Pandey. I would like to extend my formal welcome to you and give a brief introduction about uh, you. Dr. Alok Pandey is a psychiatrist by profession and a philosopher by temperament. His quest for deeper meaning Looking at the death, dying and suffering brought him to Sherbindo's teachings and since then he has been following and practicing the path of integral yoga. He had worked in the Indian Air Force and took a premature retirement to settle in the vicinity of Sherbindo Ashram. He offers his service in the Ashram Dispensary and also is an editor of the monthly magazine All India Magazine and a co-editor in the quarterly health magazine Dhamma, New Approaches to Medicine and health. Dr. Pandey has written uh, three major books, Death, Dying and Beyond, Patients at Crossroads and Vedas of the Body. He is also known for conducting camps on Savitri and various workshops on uh, different topics of yoga, education, health. And you can follow more of his work and his talks on Aroma, which has a channel on YouTube as well as the website. Once again, welcome Dr. Alok Pandey. Looking forward to your session. Namaste. Man, that is all of us, are a double birth. On one side, we have a nature and this nature moves within certain limits, prepares certain instruments, our mind, our body, life, heart, to express certain forces, which forces of nature itself. This is one part of us. Most of us are identified with nature and say, this is me. And this is what is called in the yoga terminology as the ego self. This sense of separativeness, this nature by its very nature, creates shells around us, like in little eggs, which are yet to hatch. And this is how we operate, that I am separate from this universe, I am separate from the creator, I am separate from everything else. And this sense of separativeness is what is known as ignorance. Because we don't know who we really are, we don't know our own cosmic, cosmicity if I may say so. We don't know our own transcendent self which is the divine. We don't know the play of forces which move us and around us. We simply say, this is me, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, this is what I am doing, this is what I want to do, etc., etc., which is nothing else but a play of nature which keeps us a puppet to this entire mechanism, this machinery described in the Gita uh, remarkably and a bit frightfully <laughs> as, uh, as a fly caught upon the wheel. So the wheel is moving constantly. And the fly believes that it is moving the wheel. But actually it is the wheel which is moving and the fly is simply changing the scenes and scenarios. But behind these ever-changing scenes and scenarios and circumstances and situations of life, there is something else which is our second birth, Dvij. And that second birth is the soul within us, which is a descent of, which is nothing else but a spark of the divine which is descended upon earth unhappy and sublime, this is how Sri describes it. It has entered with a certain purpose, it has entered into this darkness just as a seed enters into the below the soil and while outside we may see nothing much happening, we see the soil, we see the change of seasons, we see day and night, we see somebody pouring water and we see the storms and all these things. But deep within, the real event is going on and that real event behind the unchanging scenario or the repetitively changing scenario, the habitually changing scenario, there is this seed of the divine which is developing and this seed one day begins to feel that this covering within which it is sleeping 
or was sleeping, it wakes up and finds it too stifling. So that's when, that's a stage when we suddenly feel that all that we have known or all that we yet may know within the human limits is really speaking too limited. All that we have experienced is not enough. All that we have aspired or hoped for is uh, and, and received from life uh, and achieved and got and had is not what can really satisfy the deep thirst within our soul. Or within our being because soul comes much later. <laughs> it doesn't matter what name we call it. But we feel somewhere stifled within this little cage, this prison house of nature. And we look here and there. Some during that stage declare life as a vanity of vanities. Because that's when the dreams are there but not the means to realize it. Or the means which are there like desire are very very imperfect, inadequate. Because... When we try to realize these dreams, they are like little bubbles which break. Nothing really endures, nothing has the sense of eternity. And that's when the human consciousness takes one of the several approaches. One of them is it becomes a cynic, the worst, that where life is like that, it's a vanity of vanities and nothing much can be done about it. Some people become agnostic because they have thought and thought within the prison house and they find nothing really. The mind can take us to a point and not further, thus far and no further. Some start believing in a God above and beyond who can to an extent augment within this prison. He can probably you know, help us out, make life a little more comfortable within the prison and that's what is known as the belief systems, the philosophical belief systems, the creeds, the ideologies, the sects, religions, etc, etc. But there are some who want to break free. They look for ways and means. Is there a way that we can go beyond this prison house? Is there something beyond the mind? And is it possible for human consciousness to reach towards that? And that really is the birth of aspiration. And with this aspiration, spiritual life begins. So spiritual life is, or yoga is not a belief system. And as long as we are saying that I am doing yoga to keep my body and mind fit, I am very far from yoga because body and mind are still within the realm of nature. Nothing wrong with keeping the body and mind fit. Nothing wrong in waking up daily morning and doing some asanas to keep our tummy in shape. Nothing wrong with keeping the mind a bit more quiet and peaceful. But it is not yoga. It is. It can at best be one of those side benefits, fringe benefits that the real yoga can give us. But yoga begins when man begins to feel that there is so much more beyond. It brings a tremendous sense of humility, at the same time a tremendous urge for progress. The two go together, humility, because you realize all that you have achieved. There is a beautiful line in Savitri. All is too little that the world can give. And at the same time, a tremendous aspiration that what is it beyond? What is it within me which is dreaming, hoping, aspiring, longing, willing? And that's when we catch the real thread of this seed which was lying within a sleep and it wakes up and begins to search who is my real mama and papa? <laughs> to put it in another way, in various ways people search for it. What is the source of the love within me? What is that source of creation? Different ways. But once aspiration is born, spiritual life begins and its very first step in any yoga, Shurabindo's yoga included because we have to focus on integral yoga is to break free from this circle of nature. To first get a glimpse that yes, there is a beyond. We may use the word divine. Of course, divine has many separate connotations, different connotations. But in essence, it's the utmost of what we can be. We get a glimpse of that possibility. Very often, the glimpse of this possibility comes in the persona of a master. Because it's very difficult for man to conceive, to glimpse, even when he opens, he may see a tremendous light or he may feel a tremendous onrush of power. There are several ways that the divine glimpse can come. Shubindu describes it in Savitri very beautifully, book 1, canto 3. But it's much easier when we suddenly see uh, someone who represents to us the very highest that we, we can ever conceive. You know, when mother was asked, uh, who is the divine? So she is given different. At one place she says, uh, divine is uh, yourself uh, hiding, hidden behind a cloak. But at another place she says, the divine is what you adore in Shurabindo. So very often it requires a master. It's not a question of living master. But you come in contact with the master and you say, yes, there it is. This is what I am looking for. This is the, uh, you know, what I would want to be. Not in terms of an egoistic aggrandization. But this inner possibility, this inner self, 
And then a new journey begins where instead of being schooled by nature's ignorance, which is a very bad school because the teachers are very harsh, there is pain, there is you know a lot of beating, <laughs> and this beating has nothing to do with uh, you know good work or bad work. You know there are teachers who will give you a thrashing just because you have made a small little mistake. So nature's school is like that, and strangely it becomes harsher and harsher as we are getting close to <laughs> uh, to that um, ultimate possibility. But a new journey begins with a new master and that master was always there behind us, within us, but we did not recognize it. This outer meeting where we get the shock of meeting the one who is within us, outwardly in, in, us, you know, in a body of, made of this matter, uh, where we can conceive through the senses, a tremendous starting point. And why it is a tremendous starting point? Because it makes real to the mind which will find it very difficult to conceive of the divine as an abstraction. So this is where the journey begins and it begins with another thing which should have been the same. Supposing you don't have you don't have the privilege and the fortune to have a master, sometimes a representative word. You read a phrase, all life is yoga, and suddenly a veil is rent. Tattva Masi in the ancient times that oh, this is what I am seeking for, and that starts a new journey. This is fundamental to all yoga and the process is also quite, quite common in all these yogas and that is, um, for instance, detachment. As long as one is attached to the ordinary life in the ordinary way, through the ignorance, yoga doesn't really materialize even if we have some aspiration. And it's very simple because then we remain locked in that little circle. On one side, the soul is pulling us inward and up, upward. On the other side, something within us is clinging to the world as it is. So very often people say that Sri Aurobindo has said all life is yoga. Well, he has said all life is yoga. Subconsciously, it should become a conscious yoga. But we'll come to that a little later. So, But life as it is and our orientation to life, our attachment to life in ignorance, through the ways and means of ignorance, that has to go. And one of the processes which is best described is renunciation or detachment. This renunciation is certainly not an outer renunciation because if we renounce outwardly, then we just uh, wash the baby with the bath, bath water because within this world there is the possibility of the divine. So we are not to leave anything outwardly because if we leave outwardly, then we have uh, thrown away the very instrument through which we have to grow. So there will be contact with the world, everything will be there, but inwardly a change will begin to come. This change is what is known in yoga as the shift of consciousness inward and upward. The Gita speaks about this in the yoga of the intelligent will and uh, it's very interesting that the term in English is intelligent will. What is the true intelligence? True intelligence is not to seek the ephemeral and the transient and the temporary. True intelligence is to seek the eternal. That which is going to last, that which is permanent, it's, uh, you know, what is the use of will if it is going to be only grasping objects and losing what it was actually striving for through the objects. So we you look for joy in, you know, uh, an object, a house, a car, a relationship, but eventually we have the object but don't have what we had sought for. So the intelligent will which begins to turn us inward and upward is the first necessity in every yoga. Then in uh, another necessity is the intense concentration. So uh, after all any endeavor in life, be it even a uh, simple graduation from a college, um, not even good mark, but just a pass marks. We need a certain degree of concentration and this concentration usually in traditional yoga is an exclusive concentration. So we exclude everything and we concentrate and focus on the goal. In this yoga, because we start from the premise that the divine is in everything and everywhere, we start with a all-inclusive concentration. Instead of an exclusive concentration where we are concentrating to the exclusion of the world, here here we are in the world and yet we are concentrating on the divine in each and every activity. We be it, uh, you know, stitching something, painting, dancing, music, art, science, listening, speaking, eating, breathing. <laughs> so, uh, breathing can become a conscious activity, the pranayama of integral yoga. <laughs> Instead of, you know, the traditional way, bathing, getting ready, walking, sleeping, meeting friends, responding to the various events and circumstances of life. All this must be done in a way where these very activities become a means to reach out to the divine. So there is a very interesting story which many of us may have heard when Udhar once asked after 
20 years uh, of being here that mother how's my yoga going of course in yoga you are not supposed to monitor yourself you are only supposed to uh, monitor how much i have given myself to the divine how much i have served the divine that reminds me about the question uh, about that bhajan that i have nothing to give to the divine when mother was asked uh, somebody said that mother i have nothing to give to you mother said there is always something to give and that something is our own self the divine is not bothered that i have money or this or that our own self which we have given to this world and to pleasures to various sensations to desires to ego satisfactions that is what the divine wants so the mother said well it could have been better so very quite flabbergasted he said what do you mean mother i mean how what what uh, wrong did i do she said it's not a question of right and wrong our mind is constantly engaged with right and wrong because mind thinks doing the right thing is divine thing doing the wrong thing is moving away from the divine the right and the wrong equally tie us in the terminology of yoga if the right is the satvik uh, not the ultimate right but the right as we understand the righteousness the moral right is nothing else but a satvik bond very often more difficult to break and um, the other one wrong is a tamasic bond or a rajasic bond that is more difficult at one level but the satvik bond which looks very gold and i do always the right thing tick mark all the right boxes is more difficult for such a man to turn to yoga so the mother said well what do you do when you go to the bathroom he said um, ma i brush um, early morning i go to the washroom and i brush how do you brush so that's where he started demonstrating how he brushes and the mother said well all wrong so what do you mean ma so she said do you remember me when you brush your teeth now this is where the shift starts to come in every activity we remember and offer this is one of the fundamental practices both of the karma yoga of the gita or the trimarga of the gita as well as in shrivindu's yoga meaning thereby an a concentration upon the divine whom we want this is the first very first thing needful otherwise we may think that we are doing lot of work for the divine lot of work for the mother but we may be concentrated upon our ambition upon our ego so at the end of the whole day when we go back uh, you know we'll have the same old story where narada tells that well i am the one who loves the divine most and the divine has to correct him and say that well you may believe that you love the divine most but you, do you know that whom the divine loves most well i uh, narada is surprised <laughs> he says well people believe that you love the divine most and that may be right according to the opinion poll but i love hanuman most because he is the one who is my <laughs> sevak and servant and saka who cannot sleep anything he is doing he is thinking about me so whether we may be doing any kind of work even the most mundane this idea of big or small in work great work important work less work all this has to be washed aside there is no work big or small in the eyes of the divine and uh, you know in who shrivindu describes it in the live divine he, he writes a whole passage on it samam brahma but in who so beautifully describes the hand that sent jupiter spinning through heaven spends all its cunning to fashion a girl in the blush of a girl in the in the laughter of boy in the blush of a girl all these are god moments but we have to learn to look at it that way so this idea that i want to do something big something big comes from the self aggrandizing ego and one has to keep those things aside it's a tremendous process and great amount of sincerity is required that's what the mother says so it's an all inclusive concentration meaning thereby regardless of whatever we may be doing we we'll outwardly uh it may look just the same thing but inwardly the change has to come that i do it not for myself not for my ego satisfaction not for my pleasure not for what i may get from life from world from people uh but only for the sake of serving the divine so when we do this process a time comes when the divine automatically becomes in everything the goal of our life mother puts it so beautifully she says you are not here to please yourself okay fine so people take this utter other attitude of becoming a martyr so she corrects it you are not here to please others <laughs> so <laughs> you are here to please only the divine so this is the very first step of step of yoga that you dis- we discover the divine but now in traditional yoga also we do it so is there a difference yes there is a difference in traditional yoga say gyan yoga there is an exclusive concentration on the divine as knowledge one aspect of the divine so what happens the thinking mind turns itself away from all the rationalizing discursive intellect debates discussions and it focuses on one idea 
that idea may be sohamasmi, tattvamasi, uh, or just the omkar. And because of this intense concentration, it breaks the magic circle of nature. And it realizes the divine. Or the bhakta. He is all, his heart is all centered around on the divine. And a time comes because of this intensity of concentration of the heart. Shyam mani chakar rakho ji. Or you know, mera to girdhar gopal dusro na koi. You break from the heart and find the beloved whom you know, uh, one sees behind, tries to seek behind different forms and names. Or in the yoga works where all life, you know, where, oh, yoga works is a very powerful entry incidentally because here the exclusive concentration is not really possible. One is dealing with the world. One cannot cut up oneself away from the world. And that's why Shubindu says that the yoga of the Gita is one of the very powerful preparations for entry into this yoga. So when when people came to the mother or wrote to Shubindu, I want some mantra diksha, mantra from you or the mother. And Shubindu writes that the mother does not give mantras. She gives work. <laughs> so <laughs> work is a powerful means of entry. So this exclusive concentration can give us a glimpse of the divine. By Jnana Yoga, the process of intense concentration either in the Agya Chakra or uh, even the Crown Chakra, one can get a glimpse of that divine effulgence, that light, that supreme source. But the problem there is because the rest of the nature has been just left aside. The heart becomes dry, the power of works, the will, th that is completely lost. So when we realize it, it's very difficult to get back into life and really deal with life. So these people have a tendency either to you know, form a monastery and stay there or cut off from the world because they have, uh, it's very difficult to now come back into nature which is totally unprepared. Uh, similarly with yoga of the, the divine love in traditional yoga, the bhakti yoga. So one is so much exclusively concentrated upon the divine within that one forgets that the divine dwells in this world also. In every creature he dwells, in, in bird and beast and stone, in the blue of the sky, in the green of the forest. Whose is the hand that has planted the glow? So that delight of the divine which is in whole creation is missed out. And uh, there is a tendency again to withdraw. But in yoga works it's not possible. So in yoga works, there is an additional element which comes in, which Shurabindu emphasizes a lot in Shurabindu's integral yoga and that is equanimity. In Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, you don't need it. You can do away with it. Doesn't matter how you deal with this world because you really don't want to deal with this world. But in yoga works, because we deal with this world, equanimity becomes one of the most fundamental practices. And in Shurabindu's yoga, if you read through the synthesis, if you read through any of his works, repeatedly he stresses the need for equanimity. And to put it uh, in, in very brief, there are three levels at which equanimity operates the physical level uh, Shri Krishna puts it as Shitoshna. So we are not always, you know, monitoring the temperature outside. <laughs> or even our own temperature. Corona to nahi ho gaya. You know, this, this tendency of all the time, mind being focused upon the changes in the body, a little ache here, a little bend there, a little twist, twist there, or changes in the environment. Shitoshna. Let it be. Doesn't matter. Equanimity. Endure it. This is the path that those who have gone before us has shown. This is, you know, Ganga Dharji, such wonderful um, experience, a supramental experience he had. He used to live in a small little room below the staircase, even a dark room. And once when mother was going up the stairs, he was standing outside with this uh, uh, hands folded. And he, he, had, he was asked what work he wants to do. He said, I want to um, clean the toilets. Uh, no sadhak was ready to take that work. And when mother saw him, he says, why he has been given a room here? So the marriage and everybody is uh, all shaken because he said, how could you give a room? And Gangadharanji, no, 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 mother, it's so beautiful. This is the state, it doesn't matter. And this man, the, kind, the way he connected to the mother, it's not that we have to deliberately start living like that. That is another extreme where the ego gets satisfaction is in, you know, the, the, everything in yoga can be twisted. No, I am sleeping on the floor with a uh, brick under my head. So there was a person like that also and mother gave him a nice tight <laughs> slap to change himself. So this, this sense of equanimity, she toshna. Then at the vital level, Hani lab, maan apmaan, jaya jayo. Generally, we have a tendency to seek things which give us praise and to gravitate towards people who flatter us. 
and uh, you know in english it's called as giving the hat to somebody now we have to learn that human opinion is really not a value if i have to do the divine work that alone has a meaning and doesn't matter people will think nice people will think bad you will be honored you will be uh, dishonored dropadi you know and yet you have to continue all these will become ways and means to make our offering even deeper our consecration truer and greater so all these dualities in which the vital is ever engaged desires and dissatisfaction so nishkam karma becomes a very important aspect in this yoga but nishkam karma doesn't mean that a work in which i do just casually because i am no more interested in fruit one has to do the works disinterestedly but with full awareness or doing it as perfectly as possible because now it is a service to the divine and then at the mind's level this idea that opinion so we fight like you know as if if my opinion is uh, not accepted by others uh, it's a great crime or sin well my view point is the approach that my mind has taken toward the infinite but he is infinite he can the same sun that lights up this entire universe uh, drops on sahara and the people there find it very intense and the same sun on the mountains is different the same sun in mediterranean is uh, you know experienced differently so mental view points are okay for us to move as props each one is given a certain path um, a ray of light into the mind through which he moves and that's valid for the person but for another person uh, well uh, uh, who is an agnostic or atheist the divine is hidden himself so how can we blame him he is hidden himself so that brings a wideness in the mind this uh, wideness and plasticity are very important in this yoga because if we are fixed if we are rigid if we are narrow leave the supramental even the mental proper human is very far from us so these are uh, aspects which are missing in many yogas but in this yoga to make it simple because how do we coordinate all these things the concentration even to find the divine is on the mother and there is a great sense in it because the mother i mean sense means i am speaking right now intellectually when you <laughs> when one turns to the mother uh, all sense and nonsense enter into the super sense but the thing is that when we concentrate on the mother she is the super nature behind this ordinary human nature she is the original shakti she knows what our nature is so what she does is she starts preparing the entire nature so you realize the divine but not by breaking free from the circle magically so in traditional yoga you may have a glimpse very fast but one is no more prepared for the divine manifestation but in this yoga it may take little time because she is preparing the whole nature and until that entire nature is in a reasonable state of readiness to force the doors of the divine open shubindu says that you cannot take the kingdom of heaven by storm and if you try to do it i mean there have been instances like shri ramakrishna is a classic instance who could do it but this is not the path meant for those who want to manifest the divine here the goal is not to lose oneself in the divine perfection all yoga is first step is freedom from ignorance so freedom from ignorance means one no more identifies with nature nature is ignorant every movement of nature every thought reason which is not informed with a greater light every movement of the heart which is not impelled by the divine love within every movement of our will which is a slave of plaything of the forces and not inspired by the master of works is an ignorant movement so to step out of the ignorance means first to know that this is nature and this is me one has discovered the psychic being and knows no this is not me this first fundamental step but in this yoga even this is not done by an exclusive concentration but a concentration of the mother remembering and offering to her so that she starts working in her own way which is incalculable so she doesn't work the way we expect her to work so we may uh, feel that at a certain level we are very close to getting the glimpse and then suddenly she says no right now if this door opens you will be flooded with too much of it she changes shifts the scene now another working begins and there she is working and again you feel there am i and no come back here because she is preparing the nature and this is the mental language in which i am saying simultaneously many points she can work because 
uh, because she is the divine mother <laughs> what is there because about it so when she starts working on nature and we have glimpse of the divine we arrive at the integral divine because generally when we have glimpse of the divine through the mind or through the heart we get a partial glimpse of the divine and that's why we cannot heal the gulf between this nature and the divine but when we go through her or with her as our companion guide friend a mentor guru mother she didn't like the word guru mother father everything then she knows all the roots of ignorance that's why shubindu says that all paths become her paths even the most seemingly trivial act she can pick up and use for a great revelation about ourselves the babble of a child suddenly you are passing by and you hear or see a child or maybe a stone casually rolling by and suddenly it strikes you oh this is it you see you know that story of um, george van brickem very very interesting that he was in a state of utter depression depression means a despair whatever may have happened that's a different story so he was sitting in the ashram and was wondering is there hope for somebody like me <laughs> and he, he sees a little worm crawling out there so out of uh, natural kindness he picked up the worm on a little leaf and put it at the samadhi saying that let him reach there and then he it struck him that oh if this worm can reach why can't i so you see a most seemingly trivial act and who gave him the urge to do this the mother who gave him the flash of lightning to see it this way the mother and within moments everything was gone so when she starts working she works in a very different way than the way we understand so in this yoga the first word is surrender one starts with surrender to the mother which means mother my life is yours move this doll which has been moved by thousand forces now you please move it i become your kathputli <laughs> but she says i don't want kathputli you know i see this, this is the difference between artificial intelligence and the divine intelligence i want you conscious and living i want you to be happy with what i am doing so it has to become a glad and loving submission not a surrender we will say you move me and every moment you are saying what are you doing mother what is my life <laughs> divine doesn't enjoy he enjoys the devotee just as the devotee enjoys the divine so when we begin to uh, start connecting with her in a two way process not just i am a katputili automaton shubindu says that tamasic surrender doesn't lead us far but a conscious and living surrender of a conscious human being and say that you really and in real earnest you do with me what you want to do and then the joy of the leela the wisdom behind the leela the power behind the leela everything begins to open countless doors so many things of which the human tongue cannot really utter one has to really experience it but nevertheless it starts with surrender with aspiration and the surrender now we have got the second word but actually it is the first word um, either way we look at it how does it proceed by a more and more surrender start with a central surrender my life is yours use it for yourself then we discover so many places that i have told her that my life is yours but what am i doing making a fool of myself my life is not only yours it is my baby my child's my husband's my wife my this my that my then you discover that i have you know given a lie to the divine so you begin to she will make us conscious so you begin to surrender that okay i will do whatever i need to do for the child but the child belongs to you he is no more my budape ka sahara he is no more you know that what i will get out of the child he he is no more my atm just as at one point of time i was his atm so the relation begins to change so there is so much freedom and joy in such a relationship and with everybody we begin to surrender not only relationship things which we have when they are there with us we are grateful when they go away from us we are grateful so the, the sign that surrender is becoming complete you know as somebody says that lali mere lal ki jit dekho tit lal lali dekhan main gayi main bhi ho gayi lal the sign that surrender is become complete is a state of inner felicity and peace the upanishad speaks of shantim netare sham sashwati shantim sashwati netare sham so one begins to grow in that peace because one knows that well what is important is my relation with the divine mother and everything as its place so long as it can make me connect with her and help me everything becomes a path but if it is something which tries to obstruct or whatever difficulties one may have in outer life my connection with her depends upon her and me it is between her and me so everywhere the path begins to open
So path is not just a geographical place. The path is in the inner space. So a new uh, revelation begins that the, one carries the path everywhere. One carries the word <laughs> everywhere. One carries the divine mother everywhere. So this is the second part that where surrender begins to become more and more wide and all comprehensive. Then the third, what is the consummation of this yoga? A complete surrender, which means a total self-giving. That now you move me as you want to move me. One is moved entirely by her in thought and speech and word and act and will and feeling and breathing and sensations and everything. That's the ultimate consummation of the yoga. If one has given completely, for the individual the yoga is complete. What about experiences? There can be no greater experience than the delight that one experiences by giving to the divine. So I can say that all this is, okay, fantastic hearing sounds and uh, subtle sounds and seeing light, all that is okay, fine. But the delight that comes by giving oneself entirely to the divine is incomparable to anything else. And the Shobindu in synthesis of yoga, people think that it's just sentimentality. He says that uh, no human tongue can ever utter it. Because just as the bhakta takes delight in the divine, the divine takes delight in the bhakta. And he goes on to say, there is nothing impossible or uh, not within the reach of the bhakta because he is the very self of the beloved. We treat the divine as our self. The divine says, here is myself. And then the new journey starts and the journey is returning back into nature and pouring all we receive from her into this creation. Because uh, the goal of this yoga is not to lose oneself into the divine infinity and the eternity and the divine perfection which is within everyone. That is uh, one way to look at yoga. But to bring that perfection down into life. But we do it with a free heart. Because now we know that it's not me. That's why the knot of ego has to go completely. Otherwise things can go berserk. You know when the divine Shakti pours and one thinks, Oh, I am an instrument of God. See how much work I am doing. <laughs> <laughs> Already the titan is watching over. Uh, you are doing. No? Very good. Wait a bit. <laughs> and he will... Uh, <laughs> you roll in the mud and then... <laughs> you see the divine watching and... You didn't say me. No, no, no. This mud was little necessary. I have to give you now a thorough dry cleaning. So, <laughs> he will take us and give a thorough dry cleaning. Bring us back. So, you roll back into the mud again the same thing. So it's not because the divine doesn't want to protect you, but this is a process through which we become more and more ready. We understand that the ego is nothing and the divine is all. And the perfect state will be that, that when one is engaged completely, not just in egoless works, because egoless works is the state of Jivan Mukta, which already in the Gita is achieved. But now the nature of work changes. That's how all life begins to become yoga. In egoless works, which the Gita reveals to us uh, beyond nirvana, you can still do works as a Jivan Mukta. The works are still limited by the limited nature. So a doctor is inwardly free. He knows that it is not he who is the doer. It's a wonderful state. Freedom from this responsibility. I am the doer. I am the doer. But the works are still, when a patient comes, he will give the same prescription and say, I can only give this medicine, but the God will cure. This is the yoga of the Gita, Jivan Mukta, very high state to reach. But in this yoga, it is not just that I give this and God cures. It is God gives what he needs to give. And God is the one who cures. And God is the one who has come to me in this form. And all these are divine beings who have worn a mask. A terrible mask, a beautiful mask and you want those masks to go. So the dealing begins to change because all is a at effort at the divine manifestation. Meaning thereby the mind upgrades its software from the present rational analytical mind which is always lost in either or. It can be either this or that. And a new plenary illumination where we begin to see many things together. Simultaneously, many points, many possibilities, supramental thoughts, Shirvinda describes like that. Intuitive flashes cleave the brain, inspiration, reverse, begin to flow. Oceans of knowledge, superconscious knowledge begins to descend upon the mind. And if the mind is not wide and supple, it will break down. And very often in trying to become supramental, we may well become fit for the inframental stage. That's why all this preparation. And this knowledge begins to pour through the mind, through the brain, which is made ready. The golden light came down into my brain. The grey rooms of my mind sun touched became. A bright reply to wisdom's occult plane. A calm illumination and a flame. 
and then this transformation of the mind again it, that it's not like it is to proceed like that different people different parts are ready begins to descend and take hold of the speech and word it becomes conscious and the heart so whomever the heart loves it is the divine in us who begins to love which is a very powerful stage and it it's impact and that love is freed from all this egoistic straining oh i gave so much our love is human love even at its best without expectation is a crude calculation only thing is uh, the crude people calculate immediately i loved you one year has passed you haven't really cooked a nice meal for me this is human love at its worst it is all my life i gave to you <laughs> that is the best case scenario it's still there expectation is still there it's masking itself as if there is no expectation so at all my life because still the purpose was what the person is giving back to me but when the purpose is to bring out the divine element in everyone then the scenario changes so the heart begins to be filled with this sweetness after all there is sweetness in every heart mother says so beautifully bitterness is an illusion there is sweetness within every heart so what is bitterness it's that dose of poison which is mixed with the sweetness so when one drinks it the first taste is oh it's very bitter sweetness is at the bottom so shivindu describes ordinary life and um and the life of yoga in this way so now there are two kinds of you know poisons that are mixed one is a sweet poison so <laughs> human life ordinary human life tastes very sweet at the beginning as you come down bitterness is there inside you begin to taste the bitterness after the artificial smile is gone <laughs> but in yoga the bitterness is tasted first you taste the bitter cup after which the wine of ananda the somras begins to come so the heart is full of sweetness full of joy what wonderful felicity that possibility of being hurt uh, is soon goes away and it's 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 like it extends initially uh, it's on you know one gets a little hurt then another level so the level keeps increasing the bar till a time comes when a universal love and ananda become a way of life for a person and such a person doesn't have to do anything because such a person wherever he goes whomsoever he loves whomsoever he cares is the divine loving through that person then what about life and works well our life we begins to assume a new luminous force begins to flow in all the currents of life so the nerves now works means um nerves the blood the body brain everything is used in works the hands the feet so when this new luminous force begins to pour it's not just that we are doing the same work the way you know we would do ordinarily in ignorance new creative impulses may come not just through the brain but right at the moment of working one is beginning to pick up something and it becomes a conscious work a new either a thought comes or the movement happens at the most material level why because now a greater divine shakti is in forming the nerves and brain the body the um, you know the very blood new things can emerge new possibilities emerge things which we never knew are within us uh, possibilities to heal directly it's definitely possible possibility to speak without referring to you know shobindo's famous example where in baroda itself when he was teaching life of nelson and students said but sir it is not there in our notes which we have got from this book that book and shivendra replied throw the notes book out of the window <laughs> well he knew what he is saying by direct experience uh, already at that point of time flashes had begun to disclose so this way till the very body is freed from all possibility of disease degeneration old age and um, of course death eventually there in comes the third element of the yoga the final element when we are doing it there are cosmic forces which try to obstruct they don't give in so easily aspiration and surrender is all right but they say i am going to see you have really surrendered yes i have surrendered all my works i have surrendered to the divine see i have left everything and i am living in the ashram living behind a plush job and this is ah now i know the door through which i will enter you really believe ah huh? you have left things which never really belong to you <laughs> so <laughs> i am going to teach you so these forces enter one little boast one little door through the ego you say let me see what you have left and then the robe of vice the robe of virtue everything is 
split apart. So there are forces which will come and test us at, uh, you know, the mother uses the word, the examiners in the integral yoga. And she says there are three kinds of examiners. One which are, you know, forces of nature. They will not concede so easily that you become their master. They will resist. So forces of nature means ordinary anger, ordinary movements of lust, greed. They will return back again and again. The charm of rasgulla after all. Nothing wrong in eating rasgulla, But there is certainly something wrong in hankering after rasgulla. Every day going and buying a pot full of rasgulla. This is great. <laughs> but if you have a rasgulla, have it with joy. <laughs> Not with, oh, I have to leave rasgulla. So this is how they will... Uh, forces of universal nature. Then there are adverse forces and hostile forces. Uh, if you progress beyond nature, they come in second line of defense. So hostile forces and adverse forces suddenly will bring in doubt, despair, depression, crying spells for no reason at all. Uh, tremendous doubts, suspiciousness, jealousies, rising from what depths? And they start corrupting. Jealousy is even in approach to the divine. Oh, that person is closer to the divine. Oh, that person is working in Shurabindu's room. Why am I not able to go there? <laughs> so, <laughs> I had this experience on my birthday. I wanted to go to Shurabindu's room and I was told right in front of me, some people were allowed to go, but that's a different story. I was told, no, strictly on birthday only we allow. It was one day before birthday because I had a posting. So, I sat initially, ye kya baat hai? and then I had a wonderful, most wonderful experience Directly, Mother and Shurabindu coming and saying, See, <laughs> others are going there, but I am coming to you. <laughs> so it was so powerful, so beautiful. I said, Oh my God, the first rule of yoga is everywhere in everything. Of course, going to the room and ashram, they are all special places. But again, even there, the play of jealousy, the play of ambition can start. The kursi and all these things, kissa kursi ka. So we have to understand that these forces are waiting. And they are very, very cunning, very astute. So the rejection of all that stands in the way, mental ideas, opinion, viewpoint, we believe we have got free from that, but suddenly there will be a contrary viewpoint. And there will be a little shrinking inside. Oh, this fellow thinks still like that. Well, if he thinks still like that, it's me who thinks still like that. <laughs> That's why I could observe. Otherwise, I'll see the truth behind that opinion. And that will be the end of the story. So rejection is the third aspect. Aspiration, rejection, surrender. And rejection is very difficult, so offer. So when we ob see obstructions coming in our nature, this mother has said that rejection is very difficult for human consciousness. So offer it. Mother, but offering means sincerity to see. Mother, this movement is still in me. I am still attached. I am still eyeing on that kursi, even though I have left it behind, outside. But in the ashram, I am still looking for that chair, which I can occupy. That name that you know I still can have. So offer it to the mother. And she will, everything that is offered, changes into the divine equivalent. So this is the path and through this the transformation that takes place, meaning thereby, very simply, transformation is not about becoming a great ethical being, a saint or a sadhu or a holy man, etc., etc. But transformation means this entire nature, the mind, the thoughts, the heart, the voice, the speech, the feelings, life energy, the bodily apparatus being upgraded from the human to the divine, which is their utmost possibility. This is no easy task. And it requires tremendous endurance and faith and perseverance. This yoga cannot be done if one is wanting to look for a you know, two-week course on yoga with $2,000 and give me nirvana kind. That is only virtual reality nirvana. <laughs> this yoga is a lifetime engagement why lifetime, lifetimes engagement with the divine on this one goal that only your manifestation upon earth is what I want and nothing else. Neither mukti nor nirvana nor moksha because they are also subtle illusions. But I want only and only that your manifestation should take place, not even through me. In this creation, doesn't matter if I have to become dust and the flower of your beauty can spring forth, may I become dust. And if I have to become the sun effulgent far away from the universe, but be a giver of light, may it be so. Whatever you choose for me, that is what I want. So the final mantra is, let thy will be done. It starts with let thy will be done and not mine. It ends by saying, let my will be 
what you will for me. So the will is in complete union with the divine. May I will what you have willed for me and what you would will for me. Namaste.